I want to invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 3, and we are going to camp out at verse 16. My topic is how singing shapes our faith. How singing shapes our faith. This is how Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 reads. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3.16 is one of the best known verses in scripture when it concerns as it relates to singing. Yet oftentimes we fail to recognize how this command to sing fits in the broader context of chapter 3 of the book of Colossians. Indeed, I am submitting to you that the controlling verse of chapter 3 is actually verse 1. Here is what verse 1 says. If, you then, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. So I submit to you that verse 2 through to 16 flows out of verse 1. Verses 2 through to 16 expounds on how we may seek those things which are above. There are four commands contained in verses 2 to 16 that if followed will help the believer seek those things which are above. Here are the four. Disciples of Jesus must put to death earthly passions. Number two, disciples of Jesus must put on spiritual affections. Number three, disciples of Jesus must live in holy harmony as one body. Number four, disciples of Jesus must let the word of Christ dwell richly in us. Now the question before us is this. How does this focus on singing, which is referenced in verse 16, fit within the context of these four commands for disciples? In other words, how does singing fit with discipleship? Well, first notice the actions connected with singing. Verse 16, let the word of Christ, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So verse 16 begins by referencing the word of Christ. The word of Christ is the word that originates in Christ. He gave it to the apostles for them to give to the church. Christ inspired his word and Christ gives his word power. The word comes from Christ. The word comes through Christ. The word of Christ is the gospel of Christ. The word of Christ is the Christian message. The word of Christ includes both the Old and the New Testament. The word of Christ originates from Christ. But the word of Christ is also about Christ. Christ is the hero of the scriptures. Christ is the focus of the scriptures. So too, Christ must be the focus of our songs. Christ must be the focus of our liturgies. Christ must be the focus of our worship experience. So the word of Christ is from Christ and about Christ. The word of Christ is the gospel of Christ. 
The word of Christ is Christian truth. It is the word of Christ which tells what God has done through Christ. And it is the word of Christ which Christ now speaks to us by the Holy Spirit. Verse 16 says also, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell. Let the word of Christ come into your life not for a visitation but for a habitation. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let it find its home in you. Let it reside in you. Let it occupy you. Students of Greek, please note that it is in what is called the present active imperative. In other words, it's a command. The language of verse 16 is a command. At the very least, if we're going to make the word of God dwell within us, if we're going to make the word of Christ dwell in us, we at least have to read the word. At the very least, we have to read the word. I submit for the word of Christ to richly dwell in us. At the very least, Christians must read the word of Christ, which is the scriptures. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The truth is that for some of us, the word of God dwells in us stingily. Not richly. In other words, there should be in each Christian a super abundance of the word of Christ in our being. There should be in the Christian a super abundance of the word deposited deep in us. Isn't that what we sing when we sing, speak, O Lord? Let the word, let the truth of God go deep in us, shape and fashion us. You are commanded by the word of Christ to let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Let the word of Christ saturate you. Let the word of Christ marinate in you. Let the word of Christ fill you to overflowing. Then the passage says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. In all wisdom. Wisdom in this epistle always has a spiritual dimension. Wisdom in this epistle is related ultimately to the mind of God. The Apostle Paul encouraged the Colossians to express their corporate worship in real wisdom, which centers on Christ and promotes Christ. Have you not been to a worship experience? And seen something, something done, something said. And you said to yourself, that is not of Christ. Don't raise your hand. Have you not been to a worship experience where you said to yourself, that is purely of the flesh. And that is not of Christ. Have you not been to such a service, such a worship experience? Where what you heard, what you saw, what was said is not of Christ. It is of the flesh. And that which is of the flesh is not pleasing to God. That which is of the flesh is men pleasing and not Christ honoring. The Apostle Paul is making the point that as the word of Christ dwells in us richly, it will shape and fashion us in Christ's likeness. That the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. That's, those words kind of sound familiar to me. It, it means that our worship will be influenced by the wisdom of Christ more than by the wishes of men and the flesh. One of the things we must note in scripture is that God prescribes how he is to be worshipped. And sometimes we run the danger as human beings of tinkering with worship and trying to innovate and do things to make it spice up and look nice and what have you. When God has laid out in his word how he is to be approached. 
We do not well when we try to tinker with worship. We come to God on God's terms, not on our terms. Verse 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. Teaching and admonishing. The reference to teaching and admonishing is the very vocabulary of discipleship. The reference to teaching and admonishing is the language of discipleship. Teaching is the orderly arrangement of truth and effective communication of it. Teaching is mentioned as a spiritual gift in Paul's writings. Teaching is closely associated with the role of the pastor as per Ephesians 4 verse 11. But here in Colossians 3 verse 16, the church members must teach each other the ways of the Lord. Everybody must teach everybody the ways of the Lord. Teaching as used here is a reference to the content of our faith. It's a reference to the gospel message. Teaching as used here is the same as the word of Christ that is supposed to dwell richly in every believer, in every Christian. Then he talks about admonishing. Admonishing differs from teaching somewhat. Admonishing has a strong element of encouragement. The Christian community is to be an encouraging community. And very often our default setting seems to me sometimes to be just tear down and cuss and go on bad. Can't say ouch when you go home. Admonish is a verb that means to warn, caution, or urge someone to do something in a gentle or kind manner. That's what it means to admonish. And in the context of Colossians 3.16, admonish means to encourage and guide one another in the faith, helping each other to stay on the right path and to avoid spiritual pitfalls. So Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalm, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The Apostle Paul in verse 16 is intentionally connecting singing with discipleship. In other words, for Paul, singing is an essential part of discipleship. Please note that the command to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is given to the whole church. Not just praise team and choir. This means that if you are blessed with a singing voice, you must sing. It also means that if you can't sing, you must sing. If you're not on a voice, you must still sing. Congregations can get away with that, choirs can't. <laughs> Everybody must sing. So if you can't sing, you must sing. And if you can't sing, you must still sing. So nobody is exempted when they come to church. Everybody is commanded to sing. God commands us to sing because singing is an essential part of discipleship. Sometimes when we look at Colossians 3 verse 16, a discussion is usually prompted about what is a hymn and what is a spiritual song. Nobody really debates what is a psalm, but what is a hymn and what is a spiritual song um, is somewhat open to discussion, somewhat open to debate. I sought the help of my friend, Dr. Clinton Chisholm on this, and here, what, here's his response, quote, all hymns are spiritual songs, but all spiritual songs need not be hymns. All gospel music is religious music, but all religious music need not be gospel music in the sense of telling the message of salvation. Let me say it again because I think it bears repeating. All hymns are spiritual songs, 
but all spiritual songs need not be hymns. All gospel music is religious music, but all religious music need not be gospel music in the sense of telling the story of salvation. The Apostle Paul would have us know that singing is an essential part of discipleship because it helps Christians accomplish all the other commands in Colossians chapter 3. Let us work our way back through the commands in this passage and consider how singing functions uniquely in each. I want to give credit where credit is due. I am very indebted to the YouTube teaching ministry of Pastor Scott Aniol, A-N-I-O-L. And my next four points are heavily influenced by his teaching. Here's what he says firstly. Singing helps the word of Christ to dwell richly within us. Singing helps the word of Christ to dwell richly within us. It is one thing to read the word of Christ. It is one thing to listen to the word of Christ. It is a, an entirely different thing to let the word of Christ richly dwell within us. How do we do that? Well, the word of Christ is able to dwell richly within us through what the Bible calls meditation. Meditation. You know Psalm 1. Psalm 1, a great psalm about meditation. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm 1 verse 2 says that the blessed man meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. The Hebrew word for meditate literally means vocalize. Vocalize. Sometimes meditate is translated as to muse on something. To meditate is to engage not just the mind but also the heart. To meditate on something is to allow it to form and shape our hearts. This shaping of our hearts is a process. This shaping of our hearts tend not to happen quickly. Letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly takes time. It takes time to really taste and savor the truths of God's word. It is like when you get a nice piece of cheesecake. Don't ask me how I know about cheesecake. You could just chew it all up quickly and swallow it. But in doing that, you are denying yourself the joy of eating cheesecake. I believe cheesecake is one of the evidences that there is a God. Satan would not have given you cheesecake. <laughs> that is a gracious gift from a loving God. I, when I speak to some people, I said that is one of the evidences for the existence of God. <laughs> you could just chew it up quickly and swallow it. But in doing that, you are denying yourself the joy of eating cheesecake. You don't really get to taste the sweetness of the cheesecake. The best way to eat cheesecake is to let it roll around in your mouth so that you really taste it all the way until it melts away. That's what meditating on the word is like. You savor it. And one of the best ways God has given us to slowly savor the word of Christ is when we sing the word of Christ. Singing slows you down. You can't rush through the words when you sing. Singing forces you to take time with each word. Singing enables you to savor the rich truths contained in the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The word of Christ 
dwells richly in us when it moves from mere head knowledge to heart affection. And this is accomplished when we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's one thing we must note. The word of Christ will not dwell richly within us if what we're singing is not sound doctrine. Christians need to carefully evaluate what we are singing to make sure that the lyrics are faithful to the teaching of God's word. This is also why it is so important that we actually sing some word. That is why it's so important that we actually sing some scripture because there's no falsehood in scripture. I can maybe point it to one or two hymns that get doctrine wrong, not many. One and, and quite a few popular songs around town that get doctrine wrong. But you're not going to get doctrine wrong when you sing the Psalms. When we sing the Psalms, we are singing Holy Ghost inspired scripture. The hymns might get the doctrine wrong sometimes. The spiritual songs might get the doctrine wrong sometimes. But the Psalms will never get the doctrine wrong. The Psalms represent sound doctrine. The Psalms are sound doctrine. Yes, in preparing this message, I was convicted in my role as pastor. I recognize that as pastor, I need to do something to influence us as a congregation to sing more psalms when we come to the worship experience on a Sunday. So singing helps the word of Christ dwell richly within us. Here's the second point. Singing harmonizes God's people. Singing harmonizes God's people. Disciples of Christ must live in a loving, harmonious way with one another as one body. Paul cautions about this harmony in the body in verses 12 through to 15. Hear what he says. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the Peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. And then Paul encourages singing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing, singing psalm, hymns, and spiritual songs. The beauty of singing is that it embodies the kind of harmony we are to have and we are to cultivate as disciples of Jesus Christ. Corporate singing is at its essence a bringing into unity a diversity of, body, of voices. Let me say that again. Corporate singing is in its essence a bringing together of a diversity of, of voices into a unity. Even if all we do is sing melody with no instruments, we will still have an amazing amount of diverse voices unified in one. When I was in high school and we had chapel, um, I loved the chapel experience in my high school years to hear over a thousand boys in chapel singing the hymns, all singing unison. And it was just, sometimes I paused and just listened and said, boy, this must be a foretaste of heaven. There is something about singing together, even just the melody, that creates some kind of harmony among person to person. Singing together harmonizes us. Singing together harmonizes us. Furthermore, good music makes you long for unity and harmony. Here's a quote from Pastor Scott Aniel. Hear what he says. If you know anything about music, 
you know that music contains consonants when two or more pitches sound in harmony and dissonance when two or more pitches sound out of harmony. All music has dissonance, even a simple hymn, but good music never leaves dissonance unresolved. Good music uses dissonance to make us long for consonance, and then it resolves that dissonance into beautiful harmony. The very act of singing together cultivates harmony in our homes and in our churches. End of quote. So singing helps the word of Christ to dwell richly within us. Singing harmonizes God's people. Thirdly, singing forms mature affections. Singing forms mature affections. Paul said in verse 16 that singing teaches and admonishes us. No doubt teaching here involves using, using words to teach truth well. But the primary part of man that music teaches is his affections. This is evidenced by the phrase, with thankfulness in your hearts. You saw that part of verse 16? With thankfulness in your hearts. This emphasizes the internal aspect of human beings. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalm, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Some translation says, singing with thankfulness in your hearts. Other translation says, singing with gratitude in your hearts to the Lord. We tend to think of discipleship mainly in terms of teaching truth to our minds. And that is so, and that is important. But the intellectual acquisition of knowledge alone is not discipleship. That is important, but it's not sufficient. Obeying Christ should not be, should not be something we desire to do only from our heads. Obeying Christ should be something we desire to do from our hearts. The Apostle Paul is teaching us that singing helps us form affections. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs teach not just our minds. It teaches our affections. It goes all the way to our hearts. This is the unique power of singing. Words alone are often inadequate to express the nuances of various kinds of affections that singing can capture. Let us take one of those affections. Let us take love, for example. Secular people <coughs> have distorted that word love. Secular people have abused that word love. Secular people have foisted on us unhealthy and unbiblical ways of understanding love. Lots of bad ideas about love have been communicated by music. A lot of bad ideas about love have sunk deep into our emotions. A lot of bad ideas about love have sunk deep into our hearts. And the, one of the worst things that can happen is when a bad idea is communi communicated by catchy music. I thank God for the blood and for my good Christian friends who I grew up with, um, how they rebuked me and draw me up when they hear me I sing songs that Christian Mark does not supposed to sing. Well, I'm so glad we never have those problems. <laughs> but me did have it. And some of the songs I used to sing and sing them, me all head to church, you know, and I sing the song them, what am I not supposed to sing? I mean, it filled with the spirit. <laughs> At least so I thought. And almost all the songs that you hear on radio distort love, somehow or the other, and give you wrong ideas about love. You know this one? If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> if being right means being without you, 
I'd rather be wrong than right. Your mama and daddy say it's a shame. It's a downright disgrace. As, as long as I got you by my side, I don't care what your people say. You're going like at the first, yeah, I hear the song. <laughs> Here was one that I used to sing all the time. Cause it was a mega hit when it came out. Secret lovers, yeah, that's what we are. Try so hard to hide the way we feel. Thank God for my friends, them who rebuke me. This part don't need to go out on YouTube. <laughs> Me and Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones. We got a thing going on. I'm celebrating adultery. Them a mash up them family over adultery. And them songs are seeping to your spirit. You want one more? I get a dance hall one now. Sometimes I wonder why so many men are so dysfunctional in Jamaica. And I am convinced that some of the music we listen to promote dysfunctionality. The late artist Merciless. I have a song named Gizari. You know that song? Don't raise your hand because you're holy people. Pastor just gets saved. But you know I could see a long time. Merciless of a song, say. The other girl, Gizada, and a slap me, slap me, take it after me, father, again. <laughs> I saw the father, saw the son, see him where me come, because all of my brother have 15 sons because we couldn't afford to let the old man go. <laughs> then you wonder why we have so much craziness in the society among the men. These secular songs have a way of seeping into your hearts and numb your sensitivities and numb your sensibilities to the leading of the Holy Spirit. These kind of songs have a way of making you think wrong is right and right is wrong and Satan knows it. That is why Satan is not afraid to make his disciples using his music. Satan is a songwriter too. Satan give half truths and sometimes no truth in his songs. The other day I was taken to task when I described a certain song as having no gospel and no Christ and not fit to be sung among Christians. The song had no reference to the grace of God no reference to the goodness of God, no reference to the Father, no reference to the Son, no reference to the Holy Spirit. There is no blood, there is no cross, there is no salvation. How on God's earth can that song be fit to be sung among God's people? Indeed, when we sing the depraved songs of the world, they have the effect of quenching the Holy Spirit in your life. The Apostle Paul says, use the same weapon of singing, but change the ammunition. Instead of depraved lyrics, here is what you are to do. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We must sing psalms. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. S Psalm 3, there's a Byron Kate song that I love. Um, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. Are them songs we must sing instead of all the foolishness we hear on radio. 
We must sing hymns, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing your grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of God's unchanging love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be, let that grace now like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here is my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Sing psalms. Sing hymns. Sing spiritual songs. Some people believe spiritual songs are really choruses. Maybe, not sure. That one is a little murky to define. But I think of this one as a spiritual song. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. I'm seeking you like a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Or a song like, Falling in love with Jesus was the best thing I've ever done. In his arms I feel protected. In his arms never disconnected. In his arms I feel protected. There's no place I'd rather be. We must use singing to shape our hearts in the truths of scripture. We must use singing to shape our affections for the things of God. We must use singing to shape our hearts to love what God loves and hate what God hates. We must use singing to shape our appreciation of, of God in his holiness. We must use singing to shape our hearts to pursue love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. If we want to form disciples who display love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, then the music we sing must musically embody the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, and the self-control. This is what spiritual maturity looks like. This is why Paul tells us to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, as opposed to fleshly songs, as opposed to depraved, worldly, secular songs. Let me recap a little bit. Singing helps the word of Christ to dwell richly within us. Singing harmonizes God's people. Singing forms mature affections. Here's my fourth point. Singing kills earthly passions. Singing kills earthly passions. Singing teaches that even our natural passions need to be controlled, otherwise they can control us and become our God. Galatians 6, verse 16, Paul says, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. We must give care to avoid music that would cause us to have unrestrained passions. Music that's ostentatious, immodest, undignified, and uncontrolled. The great German Protestant leader Martin Luther warned against profane singing and music, which he described as unspiritual, frivolous, proud, and irreverent, and instead said that we should use music 
that is sacred, glowing with love, humble, and dignified. I'm not going to disagree with Martin Luther on that point. The Protestant reformer John Calvin insisted that singing and music should have weight and majesty rather than being light or frivolous. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs form a tool of God's grace to shape and fashion us in the likeness of Christ. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs form a tool of God's grace to combat earthly passions. If we want the word of Christ to dwell in us richly, the teaching and admonishing must not just reach our head, but they must reach our hearts. If we fill our lives with the kind of singing that lets the word of Christ dwell richly within us and harmonizes us with fellow believers, that restrains earthly passions and cultivates spiritual affections, then that kind of singing will ultimately help us to see those things that are above and help us to make mature disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless this meditation to your hearts for his name's sake. Amen. <laughs>